Hey everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, it doesn't have fun in the title, so thanks. The fun with pointers, which is the other one, <laughs> sounds fun, but this is also going to be fun. Um, so I'm going to talk about monolith decomposition, which are two good long words. Um, and at Deliveroo, we started transitioning to using Go, kind of using monolith decomposition. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, here's some stuff about me. Um, I yeah, only picked up writing Go a few months ago. So this is kind of from the perspective of someone who is used to doing Ruby. Um, so if anyone's out there is doing another language but wants to try and do Go more and somehow wedge that into work, maybe this might help. Um, I'm not working for Deliveroo anymore, so stuff that I say is me and not them. Um, and I'm now living in Dorset in a thatched cottage with no central heating. So, yeah, I've mo moved out from London to a, a more rural and provincial life. Um, I'm now working with a really cool company called Ratio, doing finance stuff, financial products. Um, and I'm sure both Deliveroo and Ratio are certainly hiring for developers. Ratio want remote people, so if you want to write Go, come see me or apply. And same for Deliveroo. Ratio. <laughs> um, so it's going to be a case study of how our team moved away from just writing everything in Ruby and Rails to writing things in Go. Um, unfortunately, it's not just going to be code. You need to talk about business, and coding and development only exists because it fulfills a business need. So the whole kind of monolith architecture thing revolves around business requirements at the time, which we'll talk about. Um, and this is kind of the underlying bottom line. If, if people are able to dive in and if it's helped people to run Go in production, then that'd be great. So Deliveroo was founded just six years ago, um, operates in 12 countries. Um, in the last three months, they've delivered 52 worth, leading power of pizzas worth of pizzas. Um, and it's got an astonishing amount of funding raised. So that in six years is pretty amazing. I'd like to be able to start a startup and in six years have that. So I think that's all quite impressive. Um, so if anyone doesn't know Deliveroo, this is how it works. You are hungry, you decide what to eat, you choose something, a nice person makes it for you, the app says, the app keeps you updated about, about what's going on, a nice delivery person delivers it, and then you get to eat it. So it's a, a great system, and everyone should use it, because it's good. Um, there are probably some boring definitions and concepts we should get out of the way. I hope it doesn't sound too much like school. But a monolith, according to Google, is a big block of stone. <laughs> um, it also talks about being a large organization or social structure that's indivisible and slow to change, which we might get onto later. Um, I think you could probably wedge in technical there, because those are the monoliths we're going to be talking about. Um, so here we go. That's a monolith. Easy. These are microservices, easy too. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, a monolith is a big computer that has lots of things working in, and it's all in one kind of conceptual machine. Um, and it's distinguishable from microservices because there are lots of independent, small machines doing similar stuff. Um, here's a maybe a slightly more detailed example of how, how it would work. So you've got, in this one, you've got the catalog service and order service and all these different modules and services floating around this one box. So this one server is doing everything for you. Um, and also it's got different databases, so it's got products and orders and payments. Um, so this probably means that the catalog service could reach in and get products or payments and orders. So there's potential to take shortcuts and not have a very defined sort of API through there. 
Um, microservices, on the other hand, are actual different boxes which, which just do one thing. So there's a kind of single responsibility principle there. So the catalog service will just do catalog stuff and talk to the catalog database. Um, I think it's important to say that it's not just one or the other. It is a spectrum of how small you want to get. You can get mega granular and have tons of microservices, thousands of them. Um, or you could just have a few services which just kind of, uh, yeah, more, um, they're a bit bigger. Um, so the last talk actually had lots of same concepts of this one. So domain design is a really important one when you want to try and work out how coarse-grained or fine-grained you want to be. Um, so it just depends on whether, is, is a customer, does that include an address? Should a customer be on its own, or should you have a kind of customer service that encapsulates customer and addresses, and maybe even payments? So this is all stuff that companies need to work out on for themselves, depending on their use cases. Um, it took me a while to work out that decomposition is decomposition. And composition is putting things together. Decomposition is taking them apart. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I was thinking about that. It's strange to be taking stuff apart because lots of, lots of the power of programming is that composition is really cool and you can combine things in pipeline. I don't know, like Unix commands are all small and you can compose them to make things that are more than the sum of their parts. So it seems a bit weird to be doing the reverse of that. But I suppose if you had a, if, LS and grep were somehow combined, you'd want to be able to separate them so you can use them more efficiently. So that's how I look at it. Um, this is a very subjective list that's in a very nasty color about basic pros and cons of monoliths and microservices. So broadly, monoliths are simple sets to set up. You don't need to know about the domain boundaries, so you can just, you know, refactor stuff within the same code base, and it's easy to change boundaries. Um, in microservices, it's very difficult to do this because you've got HTTP barriers and you can't have that many, can't have, yeah, it's, it's more difficult to change. Um, microservices also are harder to set up. Um, I'd say it's simpler to test and deploy a single thing than doing the same for lots of them. Um, the spaghetti code thing is, is because, well, yeah, in my opinion, it's easier to just reach in and go, oh, this is a database. I'm going to use this, or I'm going to use this service. Whereas if you have to cross an HTTP barrier, it's a bit more difficult. Um, so the, yeah, I'd say because of the spaghetti code thing in monoliths, there's a maintenance burden to that. Um, monoliths can you can easily horizontally scale them, so just chuck more, more, pa more parallel servers. But you, there comes a limit where it's difficult to get a, a sort of bigger, more memory server. So if you've already got a ginormous one, it's difficult to double the size of that. Whereas if you've got 100, if it's 100 times smaller, because you've got 100 microservices, it's it's relatively easy to just double the size of that. Um, so I was, I was looking on the internet for people who, who had opinions on this, and this bloke came up, um, who's apparently quite a, a big cheese in the industry, and he, he summarized it in a lot nicer way than I did, but lots of the things were the same, so, so yeah, it's all right. So strong mo module boundaries um, are really good for microservices, um, you can deploy stuff independently so that, um, yeah, there you can have autonomous deployments and there's less of a single point of failure if a deployment goes wrong. Um, this is an important one at a Go conference because we were a Rails monolith um, and Go is not Rails or Ruby, so it enables us to use different technologies um, but actually, there is a massive cost to microservices 
Um, they're harder to program because remote calls are slow and risk failure. So HTTP is quite a you know, hit or miss thing. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Eventual consistency um, means that, so if, if you've got 10 databases that are meant to be the same thing, if one gets updated to say something else, you kind of have a challenge about which one to, to believe. And that, that becomes a problem in a distributed system. And also, it's just more, more difficult to, to deal with lots of things rather than one thing. So I think it's important to understand where we came from. So delivery used to be a startup, and it was very scrappy and manual. And I think like most startups, you need to kind of have very quick growth in order to succeed. Um, so Rails and having a Rails monolith was the obvious choice. And I think, I think you could probably argue that it was the right choice, and possibly delivery wouldn't be a thing if we hadn't had this technical technical infrastructure that allowed us to change and, and yeah, iterate really fast, which you're able to do in a monolith. Um, when there were performance issues, we extracted bits out, and I, was, I suppose I'll talk about that. So we had a problem um, with delivery, which doesn't happen very often, but um, a page of our website would sometimes go slow and um, we realized that this is sometimes affecting the database of other queries too, which is obviously bad. So we looked at this and tried to work out what was going. And we, we found that there was a query um, that was relatively big that our ORM decided to make. And it was slowing things down. Uh, so this, yeah, this was a, a join of 23 different tables. And we, yeah, we needed all this data for, for an endpoint, um, which is the orders, which is the give me all the, all the orders I've ever done. Uh, so that was, yeah, difficult. It was difficult to simplify. And annoyingly, this, this endpoint was quite, had different uses and had lots of requests at peak time. Um, this is showing all my delicious breakfasts that I got for free at Deliveroo. Coca de Mama is really good if you're nearby. Um, so what do we do? Um, so hopefully I've been leading, um, leading this conversation to talk about microservices. So let's make a service. So I think the idea is get some data, put it in a database somewhere. We need to have a server somewhere. Sorry, I, I probably could have spent longer on the slide, to be honest. <laughs> um, and the idea is a request will come into the server and the API, and we'll fetch some data from the database, and it's great, and it will just work. Um, so it, it, we wanted it to last for a long time, because there's no point in spending a lot of time and effort making something that won't work you know, a few, day, few years down the line. So we wanted it to be future-proof and fault-tolerant. It had to be able to scale. And also, it had to be accurate and contain the right data. And actually, I think this accuracy thing was the most difficult, weirdly. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so one question we had was, how, how are we going to shove this in? Are we just going to cram it in and use a service mesh? Are we just going to forward the request from where the original API was, instead of in the monolith, the original API doing the query, which is expensive for the database, we could just forward it to our new service. Um, another option was we could use some edge routing, and as the request comes through our CDN, we could intercept ones that are going in one direction and veer it off in another one. I think in the end, we, we went for forwarding the request, but yeah. I think, yeah, others would have been good options, too. Um, we also had a big debate about whether we wanted our API to be backwards compatible. Do we want a new API, which would have been easier, and we'd had time to learn some stuff, so we knew, we knew the domain 
and we, we knew what this API actually should have because there was some redundant data in there? Or did we want to, to backport everything and just go with the old API? Um, had we, so in the end, we went for the old API, which meant, yeah, getting more data. It was more difficult, but the clients, um, and specifically the apps, it was easier for them to adopt because they didn't have to do anything because the API was the same. Um, yeah, the difficulty with doing that is, is that there's tons of extra data um, and also having to ensure that the responses were exactly the same was a bit of a headache. Um, I'm still not sure if, if that was the right idea. I think new APIs are quite cool and asking people to move forward would have been good, but it also would have meant that we would have had to support the old API with the existing, with the existing server, um, which, yeah, would have been difficult. And, yeah, and with the problems that we saw with slow queries, it, it wasn't ideal. So we went for backporting the whole API with this new service. So it's all very well to talk about data, but how does it come in? At Deliveroo, we've got, um, we use Kafka. We have a data engineering team who, who make, make Kafka work. So we just have to worry about consuming. Um, but Kafka is a distributed streaming platform which you can do normal pub sub stuff. So producers will put their changes to the Kafka and then Kafka will stream, stream those to the consumers. But also it can process events, so you can do some processing on, on a stream and then produce a new stream. Um, and you can even store things. So yeah, it, it's quite a cool piece of technology. Um, this is one, one thing we had to think about is the offsets of Kafka. And when we were doing this, sorry, again, it's not a very good slide. Um, when, when we were making, making our prototype of this, we realized that the standard way of checkpointing where we were on the Kafka stream was really inefficient. So this is how the, the so sorry, I should probably explain what this weird snake thing is. It, this is meant to be a stream of Kafka events, so think of it like a queue, and each one of these blocks is a different message. So normal checkpointing will, you'll say, ah, oh, I'm up to this block, I'm up to this block, I'm up to this block, and that's how you, you know where you are in the stream. Um, but we realized that with manual checkpointing, where you just go, oh, I'm up to here, and then whatever, I'm up to here, and I've, honest, I've processed all of these ones, was a lot more efficient, and we were able to, to run, run Kafka and consume from it a load faster. That was our bottleneck, we found. Um, we also looked into hexagonal architectural ports and adapters, which is a really nice way of kind of solidifying different engineering principles. Um, so it, it's just looking at the, this picture, it looks kind of modular. You've got these things which connect in. Um, so there are interfaces there. They look quite encapsulated. Um, and ports and adapters separates the, this kind of domain business logic to other logic. And importantly, the dependencies go inwards. So so you've got your business logic here, which doesn't depend on anything. It just knows how to do its stuff. Um, you've also got the, yeah, um, what else do you have? Yeah, and, and ports and ad adapters can isolate boundaries. So it, we, we used this and it worked really well. Um, and it's, I think the dependency direction is a really powerful thing. Um, so we had to store every order ever, and we, we've done lots of orders. So this was one of the, the difficulties. Um, the database, yeah, it was going to be intensive with lots of writes and lots of reads. Um, and we thought it'd be nice to be able to palm off this work, because previously, different services, but similar, with similar usage patterns on the database got really complicated. And I spent yeah, a lot of my working life tuning the database as a Postgres one and tuning, off, yeah, tuning different things. Um, so it'd be nice if we didn't have to do that. 
Um, originally, we, we had a relational database, um, hence the ginormous query. And we thought about maybe we don't need a relation in this, in this instance. Maybe we can just have use some NoSQL. So that, that would mean, if we did do this, it would mean that um, we could just have one table rather than 23 and have to align them. Um, I think relations in our monolith was a good idea because it gives, at the time, it gave us extra flexibility um, so that we, yeah, you can take bits of data and join them up with other bits of data. Um, so I don't, I don't think it was a, a bad choice in hindsight, but for our use case, NoSQL seemed to be a good fit. Uh, we had to think about our access patterns up front, and this was a, a bit of a theme of our creating this new service. We had to think about a lot of stuff up front, which I think is probably a good idea. Um, yeah, so the third normal, I don't know if people are interested in databases, but yeah, we in the end, we decided to go for this NoSQL approach, and we denormalized our order and had, had this kind of wide data in one, one table rather than lots, which is a big debate, and you could have lots of talks about that. Um, we, in the end, we used DynamoDB, which is a, a NoSQL database from Amazon, and you don't have to worry about anything. You just put money in. Well, you do put money in, um, <laughs> but you also put data in. Um, and yeah, it, it's really good and fast and efficient. It's also cool, so we got some street cred for that. Um, I hadn't come across this repository pattern before, but I really liked it. Uh, so in, in Ruby, we, we've got this kind of magical o ORM type thing where you can just grab any, anything from the database by using really expressive Ruby language. Um, but in, yeah. In Go, there wasn't anything like that. So we, yeah, we decided to reach for this repository pattern, uh, which is where you kind of make an interface of actually what you want. And that worked really well for us. So we decided to sketch out that this is kind of how we wanted the service to look like. We had our different topics coming in from Kafka. We had a Kafka consumer here. Um, and you may notice that two red circles. Um, so we thought that it would be a good idea to make two apps with two different purposes and single responsibilities. The, the Kafka consumer's only job is to read from Kafka and insert it into a database, which is nice and easy. And if you're working on the project, you know that you just have to consume and put into a database. And then the API just gets a request and reads from a database. Um, so the default, I idea would have been just to use it, write another Ruby app, because everyone knew it, knew Ruby. Um, but we had had some performance issues with Ruby in the past, and it'd be nice to use something a bit faster and cooler. So um, this is objective differences between the programming languages. The Ruby one's a bit slow, um, but Anyway, th this is kind of what, what was going through my mind when I was choosing which language to go for. And Go kind of was the greenest and yellowest and looked, looked best. Um, yeah, we, 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 Scala was a close call, but Go was clearly superior, so we went with that. Um, and actually, we found out that we really liked it. There were tons of things that were good. and. Yeah, I, I'm sure most of the things, new things that we write now will be in Go just because it works so well. So it's nice. So Ruby's meant, it's kind of built for expressiveness so you can express what you're trying to say very simply. And we found that actually there were tons of examples in Go which was just as expressive. So this is a really nice way of um, creating a struct from your environment variables. And there, there were loads of things like this which were just nice. We used um, a framework called Jin, and and it 
yeah, it didn't look that dissimilar from Rails, and it was it was just nice and yeah, pretty expressive. I think. Uh, I don't think I'll explain all this, but it's yeah, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, so speed in Ruby, we we thought speed was was a bit of a sore point, but in Go it was super speedy, and that was that was really good. We we were expecting it to be really fast, so that wasn't surprising. Go is really good at concurrency. Um, just to remind people, concurrency is like that, and parallelism is like that. Because I always forget that. Um, so Go routines are really good and simple. Channels work really well, and this mantra of don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating worked really well and yeah, and eliminates whole whole race conditions and loads of bugs. Error handling, why you it's not a particularly glamorous subject, um, but actually Go does it really well and forcing you to deal with Potential errors is a really nice way of way of doing it. It's readable. Um, Go's tooling is quite good. Go build. Go something about profiling is good. <laughs> um, autocomplete, linting, I think, and it's all yeah, it's all good. Um, I was amazed that to get to build a binary. For Linux on a Mac, you just got to say "Ah, Linux," and then it just works. I thought that was really cool, and it works with Docker and everything well. Um, it's also a fairly simple language, and it's designed to be simple, and you can quite easily get get decent at it or enough to do things in it. Um, I feel like the the creators of Go tried to tried to enforce that simplicity is an important thing. And Rob Pike says, simplicity is why Go is successful. And I, yeah, I, can, I think I can tell that from the language. Um, there's a really good talk by Rich Hickey, Simple Made Easy. And he, he basically says that simplicity is what you need to aim for in programming. And it, it helps understanding. It helps you change stuff and is important. Uh, yeah, so things like the modules and packages system helps the single responsibility principle, and there, there are lots of ways that Go tries to encourage you to make good code. Static typing is amazing. Um, in Ruby or in other dynamic languages, you'd have this thing, and what is it? I don't know. Can I do anything with it? Is it safe? Um, but in, in Go, you know because it's statically typed. So the linter will say, ah, you're not allowed to do that because it's an impossible method. So that's good. Standard library is actually really good. There are tons of things. The documentation is really good, so you can see all these you know, lovely hashing algorithms and stuff you have to write them yourself. Um, you can click in, and you c the examples are uh, fantastic. So it's all, all good. Some parts of Go we found tricky to get our head around, like Rails is called Rails because you're on a track and it tells you exactly what to do, whereas the freedom of Go, um, yeah, it's sometimes a bit disorientating. So maybe maybe convention over configuration, which is a Rails mantra, is maybe there are some benefits to that. Map and filter, I like map and filter, and they're not in Go, which is sad. <laughs> um, oh well. Dependency management was difficult, but has been solved with GoMod. Yay. Um, generics, um, I think that's been solved, but I don't know. We'll have to, yeah. Let, let's say it's solved. Um, so o overall, Go was great, great for what we were trying to do. Um, service, was our Go service was fast, reliable, and scalable. And as far as I know, I don't think we've got any errors from it. So either our error reporting is really bad, or <laughs> we made a really good service. Uh, I th yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll keep, keep using Go, and Go is great. So I think a takeaway take from this is that you should try and be simple. So 
Sim simplicity changes throughout time. Businesses change, things change. So when delivery started up, monoliths were simple because we needed to iterate fast and small, and we had a small system. But now, as we're more mature and more stable, the simple thing to do is to slowly chip away at, these micro at the monolith to create microservices. So this is a monolith, and that is a microservice. So I kind of think, yeah, the complexity increases as you get more features with a monolith, but microservices, even though there's a higher barrier to entry, um, yeah, is, is, is a better way when you, when you reach a kind of critical state. So keep it simple and, yeah. Here are some quotations about simplicity, but that's it, that's my talk. Thanks for staying.